hello, uh, my name is Sasha. I'm from Vaku Protocol, and I, today I'm gonna share some ideas what we developed within Vaku for rate limiting peer-to-peer -peer networks. And uh, yeah, I propose to go through uh, some recap. So I'll go through some uh, current state of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, some properties we are looking at uh, mostly, then uh, two uh, network types that we have right now, uh, meaning that be parallel uh, network types opposite to each other. Then uh, trust assumptions in which these network types often operate. Um, then uh, common struggles that peer-to-peer -peer networks do face every day. Uh, then we will go through rate limiting in first type and the second type, and then how Waku does it differently. And uh, then we will go through Waku network, some protocols we implemented, the history of it, and uh, why do we even care building it, actually. So, um, yeah, so recap. Uh, we uh, look for some properties of the peer-to-peer -peer networks, and some of them are that we don't have a central entity that govern this, this huge, let's say, network, right? This is what we ideally want. Um, this is not essentially the case because it depends on, uh, on, on architecture and it might be the case in uh, uh, terms of, uh, uh, let's say, hardware or uh, uh, logical, but not hardware, or only hardware, but not logical uh, point of view. I'm sorry. Uh, then uh, what other properties we are looking at is like uh, direct uh, data and computation sharing. So let's say me as a peer, I can uh, ask someone else to allow me to use CPU, GPU, or uh, data storage, or ask some questions, just a communication as, as, as it is done between human beings. Um, then, uh, so ideally we don't want a, a single point of failure, and this goes from the first property, like there is no uh, vivid uh, centralized entity. Um, then redundancy. Um, in the ideal world, we want uh, peers being interchangeable so that uh, when we have uh, um, like um, some problem with one person, we can just discard it and start all over with another one, right? This is what we want to have, and privacy. This is uh, the most important point, honestly. Uh, but it goes from the way that um, since we are in charge of what we are to uh, given to the network, then we can assume that we are private because we are not leaking anything extra that we don't want to leak. So essentially, reaching the privacy here. So network types, two opposite ones, centralized and decentralized, maybe. So why maybe? Because like uh, it can be implemented in one way or another. It can be decentralized on the uh, like in the real world. Right? There are many computers, but still it is centralized, meaning that there is like a spread central entity that uh, is uh, kind of governing it. Or um, it can be just a one computer and claiming to be decentralized. Yeah, we know it. There are many cases of it. So uh, trust assumptions for centralized networks. So um, we do just trust blindly, actually. It's nothing more than that. We do believe that whoever provides us this, let's say, uh, HTTP server uh, can be trusted. This is, uh, the the uh, software that they run is good. It, it's not malware. Um, and then uh, uh, another uh, meaning of uh, achieving it is to have SSL certificates and domain names. So let's say if I go to facebook.com, it is a Facebook, and I can ch check the certificate, and again, it goes to some trust to some authority that signs this certificate. So still, we are hitting this someone here. And uh, authentication tokens. So authentication or serialization tokens are widely used so that we can um, uh, like uh, authenticate some user to our server if we are a server, or uh, we have uh, some identity uh, on this particular server. So this is main things, and uh, they done for different purposes. So some of them are for the DOS protection, some of them are for just how it is done, um, because it cannot be differently done in that environment. Trust assumptions for decentralized networks uh, mostly are usually they are open source, of course. There is an asterisk because some of them are not. Um, and uh, let's assume that they are open source and uh, we can read the code. Then uh, signatures are widely used so that when I'm co talking over this network, I can understand who am I talking to. 
and uh, I can validate it easily without a problem. So using a clear mass that every one of us is knowing. Um, and transparency, because the code is open, it's probably signed by a developer. Also, when we talk to, through the network, we uh, understand who we are talking to. We know that this is more or less what we expect to get from there. It's not a black box for us. It's something open. We can go there and refer to it anytime we want to. And uh, what common struggles are there for the peer-to-peer -peer network? So quality of service is the obvious one. Like if we expect uh, this network to provide us, um, let's say I don't know, it is uh, a network for having the meetings, right? Uh, like direct talk to each other, right? This is quite easy to be to do because you just give your peers a direct way to talk to each other and that's done. But if you need to bo to do something more sophisticated, like let's say many-to-many -many connection, right? Uh, it 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 goes uh, uh, it goes hard. It's, it's diffi difficult to implement and difficult to do it clearly uh, without referring to, again, central entities and something. So quality of services works. Uh, scalability. Again, the same point. It's very hard to scale it up to, let's say, a million users, 10 million, 1 billion users. This is what we essentially want, but the mass is not there, the research is not there yet, and we are slowly getting there. And uh, the latency as well. So because we don't have much control over um, uh, the peers, uh, the bandwidth, the, uh, the network interfaces, whatever, it can be sluggish. So, yeah, this is what we face with. Connection management is a big one as well, because like someone may be behind the net, and we just cannot dial it, like we just cannot connect to each other. So, done, nothing here. Um, and the most difficult one, and this is the topic of today's talk, is spam and DDoS protection. How do we reach it in a way that we don't have someone telling us, yeah, you can receive messages or data from this person, from this uh, IP, and do not receive from this IP. Right? How do we do in a decentralized manner so that there is no one governing it like on some single point of failure? So how it is done in centralized? Uh, in centralized way, it's done with uh, access uh, tokens are generated for API, so just easy as this. You have a capacity, here is your token, refer to me with this token, I, and then later we can renew it. That's it. For users, it's a bit different. There is authorization or authentication token, and the essential idea is the same. You just authorize, you get the token, and then you refer back to me with this particular string, and if it is valid, good, good for you. If it is not, goodbye. And IP reputation. This is something which is more done on an infrastructural layer where, um, let's say, uh, the IPs uh, of, let's say, botnets, we just see the misbehaving a pattern and just slash it. We just stop receiving it. It's very easy, easily done because there is just a mask applied. So no computation needed that much. Uh, what is done right now in decentralized networks is peer scoring. This, is, this can be perceived as DDoS protection meaning that uh, if we see some patterns from peers that they misbehave in a way, let's say, I provide some set of protocols, set of, uh, set of um, uh, resources to you, to a network, and I see you are abusing it in some way, we can implement some other protocols on top that will be tracking it and will, it will be just discarding the peers that, will mis that misbehave. Again, this is still very difficult and challenging to rely on because peers might just create a new identity. Uh, I don't know, if it is a wallet used or wallet address or some uh, mathematics around it, then just a new one. So a new peer ID, then yeah, that's it. So a spam all over again. Uh, Token-based approach is also used. This is very easy to implement on a level of a peer or a level of a network. On a level of a network, it's more harder because then you have to refer to some, uh, some distributed uh, data storage so that you can see that the token is still valid and capacity, so there is a lot of updates, create, retrite, right, delete at some point. So this is what we don't want to do because if the network goes uh, up and up, like more peers, more, more, more nodes in the network, done, we are busted with this one, we just cannot do it. Um, so our proposition to it is rate limiting nullifiers. So this is what we researched uh, within VACU and VAC, which is a research group that we have together with privacy and scalability uh, uh, organization. So in a nutshell, it works with decay magic. So yeah, we will refer to that decay magic is trustful. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, these are the steps that uh, the, the rate limiting nullifiers do. So first step is that if you want to participate in the 
uh, distributed network, you need to create some kind of identity. It's not like identity that they can identify you, but you need to create a secret under some, in this case, a contract. Yeah, I know, EVM compatible, as of now. Uh, but we can do something later on with it. Um, so some secret should be created there and stake being done so that there is money on clone so you're not, not mis misbehaving. There is some, some things that you care about. Um, then this secret is used to create proofs per data packets. So let's say you send like 10 data packets per uh, second, you need to create a proof for each and every one, for each chunk of this stream of data that you are, uh, you, you are doing. Um, and then uh, what is embedded into this uh, ZK circuit is uh, only some specific amount of, mes uh, of messages, of data packets, whatever chunks of data, uh, read it as you want, um, only specific amount of them can have proofs generated. So let's say per second, per one epoch, and in our case, this is a second as of now. Per second, you can generate only five messages. Any peer in the network can generate only five data packets. Um, for Vaku, it's 150K uh, kilobytes, so it's kind of okay. Um, so every second, five uh, packets, let's say. Um, and if you generate a, sec a sixth one, then at this point, anyone who received your data packet and for the Vaku network, this is the case, everyone receives your data packet under a specific topic, which I will go in detail further on. Uh, can derive your secret from there by using the same ZK circuit. And once the secret is derived, you can, whoever derived it, can go to the contract and just take money. That's it, as easy as it is. So, uh, and after that, all following proofs are invalid because uh, this person this secret is not anymore a part of this anonymous pool so that uh, there is no thing that uh, makes this prof, uh, proofs uh, valid. Anyone who will receive them following and will be revalidating them against this uh, this table of uh, whatever uh, secrets, of course secrets are non-feasible, will be invalid. This is it is. So yeah, this is the proposition. Uh, but we are not done with the presentation yet. So. I mentioned Vaku a couple of times. This is uh, what I am building these days. And uh, the Vaku network, we aim to have this as a communication layer for any Web3 applications. This is uh, something that uh, operates already. So there are like 500 nodes or even more. The stats are open. If you operate your own node, you will see the network so that you will see how, however uh, much data is exchanged or how many nodes are there. And uh, we provide a permissionless communication layer so that anything of your uh, application, any one of your application or infrastructure or application as well, it's not only about the apps, can use it for exchanging data between points A and point B. Uh, so, and history of it is started in 2013 when Ethereum came up. And there were like three pillars at Ethereum. Everyone probably knows it, and there was in Ethereum for consensus, there was Swarm for data, and there was Whisper for um, communication. And uh, Whisper was quite okay at the time, there was nothing better. Uh, and uh, until 2019, there was not much of development. It was kind of good, it was kind of used by some projects, some protocols, it's okay, it's fine. Uh, and uh, at 2020, um, uh, a status came up, and uh, status is a messaging application and uh, they understood that there is a need for continuation of such a protocol because it should be uh, done in a better way. There, is, uh, there was such simplistic heuristics being uh, made in the first iteration that we just had to revisit it again, which we did. And we came up with the first implementation of uh, Vaku and uh, by re-implementing it, by using lip 2 p uh, as, a, as, a, as a technological stack for us, and some uh, doing settings on top and other things. Uh, we reached uh, improved bandwidth, so our devices were like not uh, hitting a lot. Uh, you didn't spend like gigabytes of data per second on just relaying everything for the network. So this was good, but not ideal. And uh, we continued improving upon it and we implemented it in uh, three other languages, so JavaScript, Neem, and Go and uh, they are referencing implementations. Uh, NIM language implementation is the best one to refer to, so if you want to check out. And up to date, we are continuing building it, and uh, we aim 
to have it as de facto standard because everything that we develop is open, every protocol is open, and we try to standardize them for many other applications such as Internet of Things, wallet to wallet connection, and other stuff. Um, yeah, so, and short overview of protocols. Any peer-to-peer -peer network starts with a discovery. You just cannot uh, bypass this step. You either already know someone you want to talk to, like a, a network or a website, right? Or you need some help with discovering that. So usually it's done by using bootstrap nodes, and we do use this one. We do have DNS discovery implemented. This is one of the discovery protocols we do have. Once you get started, it's fairly easy to continue, and we implemented some other protocols on top. So we do have peer exchange, and once you are part of the network, you can start talking to a network and ask it, do you know more peers? If you know, please share an address with me. And then you can start uh, establishing this connection or keeping it for later use. Maybe this peer is a long-lived node you can use tomorrow, a month, uh, uh, in, uh, later on, and so on and so on. And then there is a, uh, another uh, network on top of Vaku, which is a fork of Ethereum's uh, node discovery v5, which is Vaku v5 right now, uh, Vaku discovery v5 protocol it's called. We did some changes there, and this is a parallel network that is used together with Vaku that gives uh, a lot more stability for uh, bypassing some steps during discovery and making it more robust. Yeah, so relay. Uh, Vaku operates over relay protocol, which is uh, LibreKP's gossip sub protocol, if you know. Uh, if you don't, this is essentially a way for um, a specification that says, like, under one given topic, uh, you have, uh, if you receive a message, just relay this message to other peers that you didn't receive this message from. And it works, but uh, you understand it's not ideal, like, just, <laughs> it's stupid, like, you cannot scale it, right? So uh, there was many iterations for the Gossip Sub, and right now we do have Gossip Sub V2, I think. This is quite a good one, and uh, we continue to improve upon it and trying to figure out a good, uh, good pros and cons, good, good trade-off for Vaku in particular. So we do sharding on top of Gossip Sub, so there is not like one big, huge topic under which all network operates. There are some sub-shards of it, and this way we reached, uh, according to our emulations, uh, uh, scalability up to one million users or even more. So let's see how it goes. This employs a pop -up architecture, so you just subscribe and you just receive the messages from the network. Uh, RLN I already mentioned, this is something that uh, was done together with the privacy and scalability um, organization. And we are continuing uh, improving upon it. Right now there is a Ethereum uh, EVM compatible contract existing, and it can be deployed on any EVM compatible chain. Right now, this is deployed for this on Cifolia, and we are working on maturing this uh, primitive so that it can be used interchangeably and even separate from Vaku. It's not something that we are we own. Everything is open, code is open. Just take it and use it in your project. There are many more applications to this, uh, to this algorithm than just peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking as well. It can be done on an application layer as well and used uh, very well. Yeah. Um, and light protocols. So we also uh, always keep in mind the light clients such as phones, um, browser tabs, etc., etc. This is something that we implemented spe specifically for them because Gossip Sub is very, uh, very tough to to run on the, on the, on a browser, uh, in the mobile or something. So you just use request response. Everyone knows this uh, this pattern of development. It's fine. It works. And the properties that we reach by having these protocols in mind. Uh, we are private by default. Uh, everything that I'm, I was leading to is that uh, everything is embedded, this privacy is embedded on every piece of uh, code that we write. Uh, and this can be validated against the, the specifications we develop and review. This is permissionless. Anyone can join the network. Anyone can participate in the network and influence it on a level of discovery, on a level of providing services as well as just using it for uh, your own needs and not providing anything on top that you want to provide. Uh, this is securely scalable because of sharding, because of RLN, this scales and it does work. Um, of course, we still have a lot of more bottles to test it in, so please help us with this one. And uh, this is very friendly for white clients uh, because we uh, always keep it in mind and we develop particular protocols for it. 
Yeah, and why do we even bother? Uh, so this QR code leads for our principles and values uh, as for research and as for development. And we do believe in the sovereignty of individual and we think that it can be reached only by uh, embedding transparency in every piece of code that we write, every software we develop, every research we do. And yeah, that's it, thank you.